So there's some news about Victoria 3's law system in Dev Diary 7. Uh, so we'll get different types of laws. The laws make the structure or infrastructure of your empire in in an organizational way. So there are laws for power structure, for economy, for human rights. Let's look into the details. So um, laws determine, the power structure laws determine who is in control of different aspects of your country. Includes fundamental governance principles such as monarchy, parliamentary republic, which determine where your head of state is, what kind of powers they wield. Distribution of power ranges from autocracy and oligarchy through various extensions to, of the voting franchise all the way to universal suffrage. Citizenship and church and state laws govern which pops suffer legal discrimination in your country due to their culture or religion. The principles on which your, your bureaucracy is run, such as hereditary or elected positions for bureaucrats, determine how expensive it is to keep track of each citizen and how much institutions cost to run but also directly benefits some groups over others. So you could have a noble-run republic or something like that. That's pretty, pretty crazy combinations. You can think about that. Conscription lets you raise a part of your civilian workforces, soldiers in times of war, and internal security governs how the home affairs anti-insurgent institution works. So um, here, the power structure laws of a typical European nation we have here. So we have... In that case, Parliamentary Republic was chosen, census suffrage for distribution of power. So that's kind of voting. Citizenship is cultural exclusion. So anyone who is not in the culture cannot really have citizenship. Then church and state, the freedom of conscience. So um, I don't know what this means exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you shouldn't be guilty, right? <laughs> and we have the bureaucracy here, hereditary bureaucrats. As you can as you can see, that's kind of a noble run republic. That was something very typical, for example, for uh, old old Germany, like in the 1890s or so. It was very typical that the positions within the bureaucracy were hereditary to nobles absolutely or like for for example yeah you had a mining director there who had like sons and they would also become mining directors then and they would also be nobles but also in in the lower things also non-nobles sometimes were affected but it was rather run on by nobles so that would be some typical thing uh, of that time conscription there's no conscription here and internal security, you have no home affairs yet, probably. <laughs> so internal security is also something very new. It was often run by the army or something like that uh, before. Then we have economy. The set of laws define where your treasury's money comes from and how it can be spent. Your economic system is crucial. This governs whether your country operates on principles of mercantilism, isolationism or free trade, among others. Income tax determines which pops should be taxed and what, rain, what range of tax burden is appropriate. No income tax at all is of course an option and legislation to such effect will make some pops both rich and happy. Poll taxation or levying a fixed tax per head is another op option primarily used in less industrialized society because it also yeah, a ta fixed tax per head has of course a lot of problems for poorer people and basically it's a go free for richer people there are other avenues of taxation as well but these are the ones driven by legislation finally you can choose what form the institutions of colonization policing education system and health system will take in your country for example, you can keep government spending under your con uh, under control by instituting charity hospitals, which have limited effect and boost the power of the clergy, or you could pass a public health insurance law, which is costlier but can have a greater impact on the health of the masses. Here we have something. Payroll taxes require reasonable lower class wages and a centralized population to pay off but if so, can form the economic basis for a budding welfare system as seen here. A tax system based on levying might be more lucrative in countries 
with a huge peasant population. So we can see in that system we have mercantilism, which was very common back then, even though globalism made its way through that. Then there's a payroll tax, but there's no poll tax in that case, so it's kind of relatively democratic. Colonization, you have no colonial affairs, that's where it could go, should go, um, or where the colony's money would go. Policing, you have a local police force, so it's not a, a police state, it's a local police force. Education system, in that case, is religious schools, so increasing the influence of the clergy probably, but quite common um, in, in these times still. Religious schools were among the best schools available, like following up monasteries and such. Health system has no cost because it's private health insurance. Yeah, that's good for the... <laughs> private health insurance is good for the state, right? <laughs> In a way, <laughs> if you only care about the cost. Then we have human rights. Enshrining the rights of the individual was a hallmark of the era. These laws define how your pops are treated and what manner of control you can enforce over their lives. Free speech determines the degree of control you can enforce over your interest groups. But restrictive rights throttle the speed of innovation. The labor rights laws include outlawing serfdom, but extends all the way to establishing a workplace safety institution to reduce the number of people literally crushed in the, in the jaws of industry. Yeah, there's a good Charlie Chaplin film about that. Uh, I think it's called Modern Times or something. That's pretty funny. It's also pretty crushing. <laughs> Children's rights and the rights of women have a number of effects such as shifting the workforce and dependent demographics, affecting dependent income, as dependents are people with a non-specialized job that, that go for different small jobs and are also supported by the state because their income is not high enough for them to support their livelihood and extending the franchise. Welfare ensures the poor and disabled in your society are taken care of. Migration laws can be used to influence pop migration. Slavery laws determine the legal status of owning people in your country. More details on that subject in a future Dev Diary. Yeah, that's, that is critical because um, some states abolished slavery, some still kept it for a while. What will you play? I'm, are you on the side of gameplay or on the side of roleplay? That's a big thing, right? I couldn't, I couldn't roleplay a slaveholder, but I could gameplay a slaveholder. So we, have, we, we can see here, human rights. So you have free speech can determine how free your speech is. You have the right of assembly there, so people can assemble and maybe protest. I'm not sure. Labor rights. The serfdom in that case is abolished. Um, in children's rights, there's still child labor allowed, which was very common, especially um, like in England, in the coal mines. That was really something where a lot of child labor happened. The, the children would go in with their parents even sometimes and they would go to like um, the smaller tunnels where only they could fit in and they would sometimes do very very dangerous things because yeah they were just small enough to fit in they had the fine hands and they weren't as big as the others then rights of women as you can see here you have legal guardianship at least then and there's welfare in that case you have you can see no social security migration no migration controls yet slavery though has been banned but and serfdom as well so serfdom is basically a kind of slavery right so there's that so the laws are almost always completely independent from one another so we can control them. They're not dependent on one another. You don't need to do one thing here. For example, you don't need to abolish serfdom to ban slavery in that case. You can create, for example, a constitutional monarchy with hereditary succession, but universal suffrage. 
or an autocratic presidential republic with a strongman leader at the top of the food chain. You can have a secret police and still permit fully protected speech. So there's really cool uh, combinations thinkable here and that's very, very creative. So the aim is to set all countries up with the best fitting laws compared to what actually they actually had in 1836. This will vary wildly between countries because the differences were even bigger than now and there were also more countries, more like small countries, mostly. If they were not integrated into colonies, there were a lot of very small countries still there. And there are some examples here. The USA starts with total separation of church and state, ensuring no pops suffer legal discrimination on account of their religion, while Sardinia Piemont doesn't take kindly to non-Catholic pops. This will affect pops who live in the country currently, but also limit which pops might migrate there. Yeah, so if you're not Catholic, you, you won't go to Sardinia Piemont. Few pops would make it their preference to move to a country where they are mistreated by law. As a result of these starting laws, Sardinia PMO might have to look towards colonization or conquest if they start to run out of their native workforce, while North America is likely to get regular migration waves to help expand the frontier because they offer freedom. By connecting these effects to starting laws, many historically appropriate and recognizable aspects and behaviors of Victorian era nations, such as their attractiveness to immigrants, are connected to a tangible property. For example, poor or oppressed pops emigrating to the USA because of its demand for workforce and also its liberal laws, rather than being arbitrarily encoded into the very fabric of the nation itself, the approach previous Victoria Games took to encourage history in a familiar direction. So in that case, that's the setting the infrastructure right and the pops will follow. And that's, at least for psychology, that's something something very common and uh, something very well researched that people in very similar situations react very similarly. So um, I think that's, that's a big progress then made from a systematic point of view. However, these starting laws are far from set in stone. Might want to reform your laws to better suit the direction your society is going. You might want to transition your bureaucracy from a system of appointees to elected bureaucrats in order to more effectively provide services from government institutions to all your incorporated territories. Or maybe just because you want to disempower the otherwise powerful intelligentsia or your country's agrarian economy it's plateaued on account of increased reliance on imports, manufactured goods, and you want to change course to the exciting opportunities provided by a free trade policy. Yeah, free trade has its a lot of ups and <laughs> but also a lot of problems. You gain a lot of influence there, and you are dependent on other countries then, which makes this um, so interesting a system all in all. The whole Victoria thing as they build it now, dependent on economy, because that's really something. Now, there's an, there is an example here. A common effect of laws is to modify some perimeter about your country, like give you more authority or reduce certain pops more mortality. But laws can also permit or disallow the use of certain actions, such as public schools, which permit the compulsory primary school law. Permit the decree to promote social mobility in a certain state and even alter the effects of other parts of your society, like boost the effic efficacy of your education system institution. Without some degree of separation between church and state, this form of secular school system is not possible. Now, that was a big thing in Germany, uh, right up until uh, when I was a kid, that church and state had a big influence on the schools and that's actually not so far ago that uh, there was only like only christian religion um, in schools and no other religions not even something like ethics um, that that you would teach uh, people with other confessions usually 
So and we can see here an active policy of public schools. As you can see, some are for it, like the workers and the intelligentsia probably. And some are against it, which means the church and probably the industry. In that case, that active policy would unlock a new law and a new decree enabling the education institution. If states takes over, it's good for the intelligentsia because it's non uh, because it's secular and not church bound. So there's freedom of thought involved and it's good for the workers because it's accessible for them. It doesn't cost much. It's not so good for the industry because the industry wants to sell their private schools to the people. And not so good for the church because they uh, have they lose influence over the common people because they cannot have their private church schools, clergy schools, however you would call them, the religious school system. In that case, public schools is provi providing education with 30% more education access. It's disallowed by state religion law in church and state. So if you have a state religion, you always usually have uh, religious schools. So there's another reason to change laws. It's because the people demand it. That should be very familiar from Victoria. People demand change. And if there's enough people, you can easily manufacture a change. If you don't like that, that can lead to problems. Um, interest groups have ideologies that lead them to favor some laws over other. For example, industrialists have the individualist ideology that caused them to favor privately operated education and healthcare systems over publicly funded ones to ensure best access is given to those of merit in morals or in other worlds wealth. That, that's the uh, wealth evangelists, right? That's that's a weird new way of, uh, of churches. But there's a lot of that connected to that, not only Protestantism, but also the Catholic group of Opus Dei also promote that kind of thing. So um, they, are, they are, for example, they would be against um, um, a minimum wage because they don't think that everybody deserves minimum wage, something to live. That's not something they they they, they see that if you if you don't have enough wealth. It's your fault for not being pious enough. <laughs> that's like that's that's all all in all um, that thing. Like that's that's the wealth evangelists. Oh, and these wealth evangelists are of course heavily tied to the industry because um, there's that because yeah the industry of course doesn't think like that that because the the industry has not an ideology in that case. The industry wants to sell private schools. And that's why they support them. Reforming your current laws to work more in accordance with your powerful interest group's ideologies is a quick way to win their approval, permitting you more leeway to go against their wishes in the future or as a quick pick-me-up in case their standard of living has recently taken a hit. The inverse is also true. Introduce a bill to abolish the monarchy in Great Britain and see how the landed gentry feel about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. For example here, even trade unionists have a hard time saying no to zero income taxes. But even that won't make up for restricting the vote. As you can see here, neutral is due to they are approving the, the Republic. That's the example of the trade unions. Approving strongly of no income tax. Disapproving of per capita tax. Approving of public schools. Disapproving of no health system, approving right of assembly, disapproving child labor, disapproving no social security. So they they <laughs> they don't like it because uh, there's not much done in that case for the institutional things like uh, child labor or social security. In that case, law changes. Trade unions disapproves of the recent change from census suffrage to landed voting. In that case. <laughs> so 
So enacting a law is far from an instantaneous one-click affair, like in, in reality, right? Any reform must be supported by at least one interest group in your government. So you must have an interest group that can champion the change. Once the reform has begun, it can be a smooth pro process that's over in a matter of months, or it can take years of grueling debate in Parliament or horse trading between interest groups in order to pass. The amount of time it takes depends on your government's legitimacy in the eyes of the people, also on the clout of the interest groups in your government that supports and opposes the new law relative to the one it's replacing, while broader coalitions of interest groups in government give you more options of laws to enact, it also complicates getting them passed. And I think that very well illustrates how uh, getting laws to work really works. It's always a power struggle between the interest groups as well. And very often there's uh, some people that, that want to like bring forward a law that would be like really good for the people or really good for the environment. Um, and I think because it's a logical law, definitely it's, it's logical to protect the environment. It's a, it's a logical cause. It's good for everyone. But you have no interest group that is powerful enough to push it through and so it doesn't get pushed through. So if you want to have laws like that pushed through, you must found an interest group. A powerful interest group. And laws are not like produced because they make a lot of sense or something like that. They are laws come to reality because there is powerful forces behind them that support that and that are working with or against the government to bring that matter forward, to bring the law forward. And if you don't have such an infrastructure, then the issue that you want to be resolved via law will be totally ignored. That's the problem always for things like that that affect all the people. Because things that affect all the people usually don't affect them that strongly. But they have like special interests, which, which are stronger than that. And only if you have, if you treat that like a specialized interest, something will be taken to a law. That's why there's so many, for example, tax exceptions for certain kinds of groups like for for special kinds of agricultural enterprises for transportation for any kinds of things you have exceptions because it's so easy to push for a law for a small exception compared to changing a law that would affect all the people and that would be binding to all the people recently there has been a very interesting debate where you have a law that would affect all the people, like, for example, a carbon tax. So a carbon tax is pushed out at the moment. It's, it's counterintuitively also um, oil firms, oil enterprises, oil companies are pushing for the carbon tax. Why is that? They want a carbon tax that affects everyone, but they know that everyone is against a tax that affects everyone. And so you, it, you will be a, have a hard time to form a lobby that pushes, that pushes for a tax that affects everyone. They will have so many opponents that it never, it will never become reality. While on the other hand, if you would push for a, for a very specific issue, like taxing the big oil companies and uh, have them pay an extra carbon tax because they produce so much carbon, that would be much easier to push through. So um, if you want to push for an issue, you, you must select a very specific thing. And that's the same here in Victoria 3. And that's why this system, uh, together with the economy, 
is so well done, I think, because it simulates still the current society very, very well if it works as intended. So coming back to the pops, I'm sorry about this all kind of big thing now. Um, uh, pops have a profession collected income consume goods depending on the economic preconditions you have created in your country. These material concerns in combination with a few others such as literacy determine which interest groups they support. Other aspects such as your country's laws influence how much political strength the pops provide to those interest groups. The interest groups have an approval score I favor certain laws over others. We have seen that in the interest groups. They favor certain specific laws. As a result, different groups of POPs approve more or less of the society you've built, depending on their economic well-being first, and their demands for change is more or less intimidating, depending on how many and how strong they are, and probably also how disgruntled they are. You may choose to placate an angry group or further benefit an already content group for extra benefits, but in doing so, some other group will become displaced. We've seen that with the interest groups. If you cater to their interests, you will get extra bonuses. Have you built your society resilient enough to navigate these ebbs and flows? Most importantly, which of the many, many routes will you take to move forward? That's the, the, the cool thing. To try that out, right? To, to play with that. It's a sandbox, it's a game to win, but it can also be, in a way, a sandbox. And the sandbox is is strongly connected to roleplay. But there's also the gameplay aspect, and you can optimize that as well, in different aspects. And because it's so intertwined, it's fascinating. Thank you for watching, and happy gaming to you. Have a great time. Until next time, and happy gaming. This is Simon Khan signing out. See you soon and happy game.